Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and, and good morning to everybody. Glad to see you here. Hope you had a good evening yesterday. Uh, this morning, I, I thought yesterday was just a fabulous day of, uh, of, of talks and panels and meeting people and so on, and I'm sure today is going to be similar. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Representative Rosa DeLauro, a Democrat from Connecticut. Over the years, R Representative DeLauro has served as either the chair or the ranking member on the House Agriculture Appropriations Committee. And she's gained a deserved reputation as the leading advocate in the House of Representatives for national policies to alleviate hunger, prevent foodborne illnesses, promote help, health, help small farms, and protect rural America. She has been the leader in efforts to stop junk food advertising to children, to reduce sodium levels in packaged and restaurant foods, to win passage of the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, and also of the law that will shortly require restaurants to list calories on their menu. She's a strong supporter of Food Day, and on soft drinks, with Rosa on our side, we can't fail to prevail. So Rosa, if you'd like to come up. And before you start, I'd like to give you a Life Sweeter Champion Award, oh lovely pitcher and glass. I love it. This is fabulous. And, if any, and I didn't have to go to a bank and put money into an account. <laughs> you didn't even have to give a speech. speech you right. can go I home. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Where, oh, here, I'll put it right here so I don't. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to all. It's great to be here uh, with you this morning. And uh, uh, I, I really am very, very excited about the opportunity to be here. And I want to say thank you uh, to, uh, to, to Michael and to the center for inviting me to join uh, with all of you today. And more importantly than that, I just want to say that we owe you such a debt of gratitude uh, uh, at the center and every, everyone here for the hard work uh, that you have been engaged in for your leadership and standing so tall on promoting the uh, crucial issues of health and nutrition and food safety uh, and, uh, and sound science. Uh, just to say, since Michael worked with other scientists to found CSPI some 40 years ago, the center has been standing up for consumers and, uh, and working so hard to make food uh, and beverages healthy and safer uh, for consumers uh, and for American families. Uh, I have enjoyed working with you on so many issues, uh, and I have really counted uh, on the work that you do in order to assist me in my efforts uh, as well. And that's on issues that range from food safety to menu labeling to school meals, sodium consumption, and most recently our our adventure in food day. So uh, I look forward to working closely together uh, uh, and to continuing that effort. I'm honored to receive the award. Um, I guess a picture is worth a thousand words. I don't know. I know, bad joke, bad joke. What can I tell you? I'm not good at jokes in any case, but I will take it. It will be in my office, uh, and that's the, the, uh, the, uh, the glass that I will drink from. I thank, it means so much to me. I, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to, to receive the, the award. Uh, and I, I also want you to know that I take it uh, as a call uh, to continuing to try to help to make a difference in people's lives, which is something all of you do every single day. There are public health officials here today, nutrition ad, uh, activists, advocacy organizations, and I feel like I'm at home, that I am with friends uh, here this morning. Uh, and we are here to talk about what is a critical issue. And I understand that it was a great day yesterday. Um, lots of kudos uh, to you on that. Um, I, you, you, you know this, we need not mince words. We are facing a crisis in this country. The growing epidemic of obesity is harming both the health and the quality of life for American families, especially our children. Not once, you know, I, I just have to tell you this. This morning, uh, two of my grandkids stayed over last night and was trying to get them ready to get out the door. And the seven-year-old Rigby said to me, Bubby, what are you doing? I was going over this speech. I says, 
I'm going to give a speech this morning. She says, well, what are you going to give a speech on? And I said to her, it's about you. It's all about you and sugar and soda and sugary beverages and so forth. And she said, will you read part of it to me? And I just picked out parts. I mean, that is what this is about. This is about what's happening uh, in this nation and the effect of, 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 of all of this on our kids. Not one state met the Healthy People 2010 goal of lowering the prevalence of obesity to 15%. In fact, the number of states where 30% of the population was obese increased from zero in 2000 to 12 in 2010. And even as adult obesity has doubled in recent years, we have seen child obesity triple. One in every three children or adolescents in our nation is now overweight or obese. A mission readiness report recently found that as many as 75% of Americans aged 17 to 24 are currently unfit for the armed services. More than a quarter of those young Americans, 27%, are unfit because they are overweight or obese. This is a national security issue uh, as well. And according to some estimates, obesity cost our country ne nearly $150 billion in health care and related costs in 2008, roughly 9% of total health care spending. If we do not take action, the American Public Health Association estimates the cost would reach more than 20% of health care spending in 2018. Even worse, if the trend continues, kids today may be the first generation in America to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. Think, you think about that for a, a moment, a shorter life expectancy than their parents. You know, and that doesn't begin to discuss the quality of life as the prevalence of chronic diseases, including diabetes and cardiovascular disease, uh, are more prevalent. Inaction is unacceptable. Inaction is irresponsible. It is wrong. And those of us who have an opportunity to turn that around need to be held accountable for doing that. This is what our job is all about. This is an, an epidemic that we need to confront. It is clear that the obesity epidemic has been reinforced by numerous leading external experts, uh, 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 that, uh, that we have this problem uh, by those who have gathered to talk about it, for instance, the Institute of Medicine. And they have said that effectively stemming this tide will require a multi-pronged approach. We have report after report that comes out, including one that was just a month ago, calling for the same thing, a comprehensive cross-cutting strategy to put us on a healthier path. So what can the Congress do to make a difference? Well, as you might imagine, I have some opinions on this subject. Uh, first, we need to make sure that families have easy access to affordable, healthy foods. We all know that families are struggling economically today, and those who are struggling have a difficult time finding affordable, healthy food options. It's often very difficult, if not impossible, to find affordable, nutritious foods in high-poverty neighborhoods. When you do, those few healthy options are often surrounded by a mountain of unhealthy options. So we need to do more to improve access to these foods, to get healthy foods and drinks in front of children. That includes reforming our agricultural and health programs to support the production and availability of these products. We should support programs in the Farm Bill that encourage the production of fruits and vegetables rather than programs that make unhealthy additives like high fructose corn syrup so cheap. We also need to encourage healthy eating and exercise habits. And one great place to do it is in our schools. Kids consume roughly 35 to 50 percent of their daily calories during the school day. Countless studies have shown that children with access to nutrition breakfast learn more and they perform better in school. 
Just on that note, let's watch very carefully what is done in the Appropriations Committee in Agriculture uh, and in the Farm Bill that's now coming uh, up for discussion in the Senate about what they are willing to do to nutrition programs, school breakfast, school lunch, food stamps, etc. We need your help in these areas. 18% of high school students in 2007 met the physical activity guidelines. Only a third of them had uh, physical education classes, which have been cut back or eliminated because of the economy. When you think about what is going on in our schools and cutting back on physical education programs. I just read a great paper by the researchers at the Rudd Center that encourages schools to develop and write comprehensive wellness policies. Um, that include nutrition, education, physical activity. Such policies will go a long way toward fighting obesity and fostering wellness during the school day. And read the report. It's a short report, and it has mixed results about where those plans are well-developed, where they're strong, uh, and they're implemented. They have success, but they vary across the country. And we have to focus in on making sure that they are well done, that they are strong, and that they are implemented programs. Similarly, at the end of the last Congress, I and others worked hard to pass the Hunger Free Kids Act, which expanded access to meal programs for at-risk children, improved the nutritional quality of all foods in our schools, and it did this by setting standards uh, about how we move to get junk food uh, uh, out of the classrooms uh, and out of the cafeterias. The First Lady has led on this through programs like Let's Move Salad Bars uh, into schools. The bill also gave the USDA the authority for the first time to regulate competitive foods in schools, the non-school meal products that surround kids while they are at school. The regulations are being fine-tuned. It's imperative that they be strong so the healthy school meals are complemented by a healthier school environment. We need to work together to ensure that they are not weakened by outside special interest groups. <laughs> Schools are a place to start. Uh, and uh, schools are a good place as well to put pressure on the industry to step up and to do their part. The American Beverage Association says its members have cut 88% of the calories shipped to schools since 2004 by offering less sugary drinks and emphasizing water, low-fat milk, and juice. The drinks now also list calories on the front of labels. Now, this is a step in the right direction. But we must also work to ensure that families have easy access to the nutrition information that they need in order to make the healthy choices. One of the pieces of the Affordable Care Act that I am most proud of is something that I worked very, very hard to include, and that is menu labeling. Thank you. For so much, so much time and for several years, I was the crazy aunt in the attic uh, dealing with this issue. But as states began to move and to make changes, the industry said, whoa, we are endangered here. Let us come together and reason and come forward with what we can agree to. And, and that it was a critical, I believe, critical to changing behavior uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in this country. From now on, any fast food chain or restaurant with 20 or more locations is required to disclose the basic uh, calorie content of their food and drink choices, and that has to be on the menu. Vending machines have to display the nutritional information of the foods and the sodas that are on hand. And as the regulations are being developed, we need, again, we need your help. We need to work to ensure that this includes all restaurants, all similar establishments, areas like movie theaters and grocery stores. You've been to the movie theater lately? They are selling food. They are selling food and should not be exempted from these regulations. And it is no coincidence that as obesity rates have skyrocketed, skyrocketed uh, Americans have eaten more and more of their meals outside of the home. Families eat out twice as much as they did in 1970. An estimated one-third of calories are now consumed, and almost half of the total food dollars are now spent at restaurants and eating establishments. That's a lot of one's diet, really, to spend flying blind 
in terms of calories. The research has shown not only are many Americans unaware of the recommended calorie intake suggested for healthy living, uh, but consumers and even expert dietitians also have a hard time assessing the calorie level of a fast food meal just by sight. A study conducted by NYU and the center found several years ago that even nutrition professionals consistently underestimated a meal's calorie count by 200 to 600 calories. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, consumers will soon have the information they need up front to make nutrition decisions. A study by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where menu labeling went into effect in 2008, found clear evidence that people who saw the calorie information bought uh, food that had fewer calories. Better information works both ways. In California, where menu labeling has already gone into effect, we have seen restaurants offering more healthy choices, making other items on their menu more health conscious in preparation for the calorie information being more available for public consumption. You know, when restaurants begin working to compete over the best low calorie options, everyone will benefit. But another part of making sure families are getting the nutrition information they need is to making sure that the information is accurate. Many of you know, a few years ago, the food industry created its own labeling system called the Smart Choices Program. To qualify for a Smart Choices label, a food product had to meet a set of criteria that was based on FDA dietary guidelines that suggested it was a healthy option for families. But there was a catch. The dietary guidelines did not set a standard for sugar. No standard for sugar. And so we saw extraordinarily sugary cereals such as Fruit Loops, Cookie Crisp, being promoted as FDA-approved healthy options. A Republican colleague of mine put it clearly, just because you eat one donut instead of two does not make it a smart choice. And I know you all saw the TV advertising with youngsters talking about the nutritional value because maybe there was 1% of fiber. And they had children advertising to children about uh, the benefits of these cereals. And this is why we have to work on strong front of package labeling standards with the FDA. These front of package labels can seem so helpful, but if they're not grounded in science and the recommended dietary guidelines, they have the potential to mislead consumers, to make us think that we are buying foods that are healthy when in fact they may have sky high sugar levels. To be useful, the labels have to be clear, accurate, a fair representation of the product, and misleading front of package claims focused on only one or two nutrients, as I said, but overlooking the bigger picture. Sodium uh, and added sugars, for example, should not be allowed. We have to improve the standard and process for labeling so that these sorts of misleading claims cannot be made, and so consumers have the ready access to the information that they need. We should also consider and pursue improving the nutrition facts of packaged food. It should be easier to identify added sugars in the foods we consider buying in the grocery store. The American Heart Association recommends no more than 100 to 150 calories from added sugar be consumed each day. In fact, an average of 16% of the total calories consumed by Americans come from added sugars. While our own dietary guidelines recommend it to be no more than 15%, and the World Health Organization recommends no more than 10%. I began working in February uh, to improve this by encouraging the FDA to modify the nutrition facts so that added sugars are clearly identified. We should always make it simpler to make healthy choices. Transparency, and improved labeling help consumers do just that. I was proud that 14 public health organizations joined that effort, including CSPI and other groups who are here today. A lot of these added sugars, as you know, are coming from 20 ounce to 32 ounce bottles of soda. According to the studies, the average teenager consumes approximately two 12 ounce cans of soda 
per day. That adds up to 20 teaspoons of sugar and 300 empty calories, 20% of the recommended daily calorie intake and twice the recommended limit from sugars. It's far too much. These empty calories are part of our general health problem. They can come from sodas and from other excessively sweetened beverages. So what can we do? You all know what Mayor Bloomberg is doing, what he's recently announced, his intention to outlaw the sale of any cup or bottled of sweetened drink larger than 16 ounces at city restaurants, delis, street carts, and theaters in New York. Yes! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the portion size issue, by the way, it's pervasive. 20 years ago, two slices of pizza had 500 calories. Today, it's 850 calories. The average movie theater popcorn service was five cups, 270 calories. Today, we're buying tubs that have over 600 calories. I have to say that under Mayor Bloomberg, New York has been consistently ahead of the curve on public health proposals, from trans fats to menu labeling and now to sodas. And it's why I am pleased that one of his key health aides, uh, Thomas Frieden, has moved to the Center for Disease Control in 2009. We know that the mayor is receiving a lot of pushback, but I, I, I applaud him. A number of us have provided commentary and quotes on his behalf to, to push back in this area. Uh, I commend him, as I say, it is always going to be an uphill battle to make these tough stands, to be able to make progress in our efforts to stem obesity uh, and this, this epidemic in our country. We need this kind of leadership. We need it state by state, and we need it at the national level. It's not easy. Who said it was going to be easy? But that's why you take the challenge on, to be able to make a difference. You all saw what happened with the interagency working group on food that is marketed to children. It was a collaboration among the Federal Trade Commission, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the Food and Drug Administration. We know for a fact that marketing unhealthy foods to children exacerbates the obesity epidemic. In 2005, in December, the Institute of Medicine issued a report on food marketing to children and youth. The report, a review of the scientific literature, concluded, and I quote, television advertising influences food preferences, purchase requests, and diets, and is associated with the increased rates of obesity among children and youth. And this dovetails with our own common sense. And yet, that important interagency effort to create voluntary I repeat, voluntary guidelines and recommendations to address this problem has been delayed. It's been stymied time and time again, and in no small part to aggressive lobbying. And in fact, according to Reuters, the food and beverage industries have doubled their lobbying over the past three years. 2011, Coca-Cola spent $4.7 million to lobby against the guidelines. PepsiCo, 2.6 million. Kraft Foods, over 2 million. Grocery manufacturers, uh, almost 3 million. National Restaurant Association, 2 plus million. To be fair, our friends here at the Center for Science and the Public Interest paid $70,000 last year to <laughs> lobby on behalf of healthy foods. <laughs> now that's what the food and beverage industry paid every 13 hours. It's humorous, but that's what we are up against. You've seen the ads in the post. You take a look at what's in Congressional Quarterly. It's a lobbying onslaught. But you know that bodes well for our activity. It bodes well for our activity. You know, this is a prime indication of why we need science and not money to drive our efforts and why the work that you do is so important. It's valuable research. And I will give a shout out to the work that's being done by uh, Dr. Kelly Brownell uh, and his staff at the Rudd Center. It's about New Haven, guys. What can I tell you? So, and I am truly, we have worked together over the years. I'm so proud, you know, to, to represent uh, uh, the, um, uh, the center. Uh, and uh, it, 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 they have never been afraid
to stand up and speak out on what the right thing is doing. And they stand tall on the research and the science that drives all that they do. Uh, and, you know, I, we tried to push back uh, um, uh, and work with and support the, uh, the interagency group, but I will tell you that this lobbying onslaught uh, is doing so much more today uh, 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 to focus on this issue and that we have got to push back very, very hard. Um, I told you about the CQ document. Recently, we saw Disney make the decision to no longer um, accept advertisements for junk foods on its children television and radio programming on its websites. That's a commendable step uh, in the right direction. And I commend Disney uh, for doing this. But let's keep a perspective. They are a single company albeit a large company. What about Nickelodeon? What about the Cartoon Network? You got kids, grandkids who are watching cartoons on a Saturday morning? You know this as well as I know it. And all the other media outlets that our kids are exposed to. From 2003 to 2009, the percentage of ads aimed at kids that were for unhealthy food decreased from 94% to 86%. It's not enough. We have to do more to push the industry to do the right thing. And one step the Congress can take on that front is to eliminate the tax deduction for marketing unhealthy products to children. We may not be able to prevent the industry from pushing unhealthy products on kids, but at the very least, we should not be subsidizing them from the federal level. That is not what our responsibility is. We should not question uh, the, uh, the experts that tell us we need to improve the messaging and the marketing environment. We should not be limiting the actions of groups like the Interagency Working Group. Instead, we need to encourage them, support stronger science-based policies that will improve the media environment that we all live in and that influences our decisions. Along with advertising, we must also address the situation in the marketplace. There is no reason that the least expensive beverages are often those with the least value to our health. Things like regular cola or juice drinks that are only 10% juice. This is not just a soda problem. It extends throughout the grocery store. Produce, produce should be just as accessible to each American as processed foods and carbohydrates. When a two liter cola is 99 cents and fruit juice is $3.49, we know where the consumer is going to put their money. So we should consider policies that will make healthier foods more competitive and easier choices for everyone. And yes, that should include looking at a tax on high sugar drinks like sodas. We know a soda tax would be an uphill climb. But we need to consider all the options that could make the healthy choices more affordable and that would encourage the marketplace to reflect soda's true cost. If there was ever a time when we can move on this effort, it is now. So we can't, we need to be relentless in pushing forward. 33 states have some level of soda tax right now, averaging roughly uh, about 3% but they tax it mostly in the way that, uh, that they deal with food overall. And the levels vary state by state, while the underlying issue affects our entire nation's public health and health care costs. The reality of looking at a soda tax, in my view, will have much of the same effect as that restaurant industry when we are looking at menu labeling, is that when the states take it up, uh, and are, are doing some things, they will want to say, let's come to some, con uh, uh, to some consensus so that we are not being whipsawed state by state. We know that added sugars are a key source of empty calories in our diets and that sodas and other drinks are the number one source of those sugars. We should not stand by as an ever-increasing number of Americans suffer diabetes, cardiovascular disease, as the prevalence of obesity continues to increase. And I might add, it, it explodes the cost of health care. We are each responsible for making healthy choices for ourselves and our families. And these are very, very personal decisions. But we have to recognize 
what science tells us, that these decisions are heavily influenced by our environment. And as such, it is critical that we continue to encourage healthy policies at the federal, the state, and the local level. And this is why the work of CSPI and of others, what you do is so powerful. You are helping to push us all to a better place, to improve the policy and regulatory arena, to make healthy choices the easy choices, to make health food accessible and affordable across the country, not junk food and sodas, but safe and healthy produce and other food products. As we in the Congress must work with you to improve policies across the spectrum. And that is in the Farm Bill, in the Agricultural Appropriations Bills, in our tax code, in the very types of research that we support. We cannot stand by. We have a moral responsibility to engage. That is what our job is. If it isn't, send us all home. <laughs> send us all home and find a group who will take on the issues. We cannot stand by and wait for obesity rates to keep rising or wait for another report from the Institute of Medicine to tell us what we already know. Obesity is a national crisis, and we must act now. Thank you very, very much for listening to me this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have time for some questions? I do. I didn't know. Yes, Great. I do. Sure. I want to get Kelly up here also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman DeLauro. You may be a doting bubby or a crazy aunt, but we love you and just love your energy, the energy you bring to this, the, pa the passion, the perseverance. And I know uh, Kelly, one of your constituents, would like to say a few words. So, K Kelly, why don't you... No, come up, come up here, Kelly. Oh, there's the microphone. We got a mic. We got a mic. Wait. Wait, we got a mic. Thanks. I happen to live and work in the district where where Rosa resides and, and represents us all. And in, there are 435 members of the House of Representatives, and there's no greater champion for the defense of children, for the protection of people, for food and food policy issues and food safety issues. So what a wonderful job you do, and God bless you, and we all support you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman DeLauro has time for a few questions if anybody uh, would like to find out what's going on with the Farm Bill or uh, some of the other controversial issues that are happening right now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. My name is Jonathan Kirch, and I work for the American Heart Association in the fine state of Delaware. And I want to ask you a question uh, but more pose a, a, a bit of a challenge to you. Sure. I, I applaud you and, and thank you for, for being so uh, firm on all these issues. But uh, in my state of Delaware and in other states around the country, you mentioned menu labeling bills were introduced and were advanced, and they were all abandoned at the point in time when the Affordable Care Act passed and sure. we all anticipated calorie yeah. menu labeling. It's been in federal law for how many years now? And, and I tell you, there is a lot of frustration from health advocates across the country when we anticipated that this would be implemented. So I would just ask you, uh, you know, is the timeline the Supreme Court? And would you call Michelle and call Barack and say, where's the calories? It's, I mean, <laughs> we, we need to keep fidelity to the things that we do. 
Right. Thank you. I, I, I totally concur. And, but I will tell you that they are truly, I mean, I mentioned some of the industry folks that are uh, uh, continually putting pressure uh, in this effort. And I've had conversations uh, with, uh, with Dr. Hamburg. I've talked within the White House to uh, uh, Nancy and Minda Parl, to all the other the folks in there to talk about you know, what's happening. The, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the pressure from special interest groups has been uh, really unbelievable. Uh, and we've got to fight that. I, I don't want to see these, these uh, 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 you know, uh, regulations or the intent of the Congress on this to be watered down. And I ask for your help in that direction. Uh, the movie theaters are giving us an incredible time. And that's a large industry, my friends. It's a very large industry. But I said, you go to movies, you take your kids to movies, it's nachos and cheese, the size of the sodas, it's the, the, the tubs of the, the popcorn. They want to say they're not in the food business. They put themselves in the food business. And we need your help. And one of the things I also want to say to you is, you know, some of the states did have stronger measures. And I realized that. And that was heartbreaking to me, but getting a national standard is incredibly important to make sure we are doing this nationwide, and on that, we can, we can, we can build. Uh, and so I, I will tell you, listen, I think I stopped in Delaware on my way driving back, and I don't know, I, I went and looked, my husband and I were there, and I looked, and there was, I may have been Burger King that was in there, and I looked at the, and there were no there were no uh, uh, calories listed. So I said, where are the calories? They said, well, you know, you can, you can, uh, uh, when we, you, you can get it when you get your, um, you know, your, your uh, meal. I said, well, it doesn't do me any good if I, I know that. So I just made my point. But, there, but then I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter, to the, you know, to the president of the company. I said, unfortunately for you, I stopped in Delaware at your, your place. But, I mean, we've got to keep the pressure on, on this, on the agencies, the federal agencies. And it's bothersome to me. But we also need to help to provide that, that strength that doesn't allow these special interests to change the direction of what our intentions were. Thank you. I'll take a couple more, then I have to have okay. a press conference. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, right here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Erin Hagen from PolicyLink. Uh, first, I just want to yes. say on behalf of Judith and Angela and myself, thank yes. you so much for You're being such great. a champion on the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. Um, and we t we've talked a lot, and you talked this morning about how much the industry is spending on marketing and on lobbying, and, uh, and then how much social justice organizations and, and uh, public health organizations are able to spend. So I think it's unlikely we'll ever compete on a dollar amount. But what can we do? What are, th what are things that can be done? Let me just tell you, you have, you have networks of people. Most recently, take a look at what happened with the, uh, the issue on beef and the uh, description of the, um, uh, the, the portions of the beef that were regarded as what they called pink slime, okay? They've been, they were, it was identified as pink slime. It was a, a mother got on a blog all over the country, went viral. USDA says now that they, the, the, in, the industry uh, they, they can, uh, schools can take it, not take it. They changed behavior, in other words. You have networks of people. Do you understand the pressure that can be brought on members of the House and Senate if it is overwhelming, if they overwhelmingly are hearing from parents about the health of their children and what the members ought to be doing? what they should be supporting, and how they should be voting. We need to rely on you to help get that word out. We can't do that alone. We don't have the capacity. You do have the capacity. That external pressure on the institution is critical to making change. It has done it historically, most recently with the whole set of privacy issues around the Internet. The legislation was tanked. You shut down the servers. <laughs> you clog up the phones. 
you get their attention. I promise you, they will respond. Nothing focuses your mind like a death sentence. <laughs> I'm serious. De I am very, very serious. You have to respond, otherwise you're not in the job very long. Get to families. That's why I said this is the moment. This is the moment. There is an awareness out there on health, on the obesity epidemic, on food safety. We have not had this opportunity in the past. Let's take advantage of it because you all know the windows in Washington don't stay open long. Walk through with the hordes. Okay. <laughs> okay.